Hi, right, good evening, everyone. Uh, welcome to our second webinar, seminar, <laughs> webinar, seminar. And um, we're coming to you from the uh, 46 Kaiser Mikatu, right next to the side entrance of the Savoy Theater in downtown Helsinki. A um, couple of things I want to say before we start. Uh, this is the fourth year of the festival. Um, my hat's off to Raphael, the artistic director, who uh, once again pulled it off miraculously. With uh, uh, really with uh, by the will of force, and uh, the festival runs began in the beginning of July and runs to the end of September. There are eight uh, outdoor exhibitions and three indoor exhibitions. We are coming to you from one of the indoor exhibitions. Uh, it's a beautiful space with a lot of really nice work, um, and. Um, also, there are a number of educational events, so I definitely take a look at the website uh, if you're interested in any of those things or all of them. Uh, the uh, program is very simple. The format, what we do is we have four photographers, and um, they each have 10 minutes to uh, show their work and talk about it, uh, and then five minutes for uh, open discussion. Uh, whether it's uh, questions from anybody uh, watching or the other photographers, uh, we just kind of leave it open. And um, so why don't I begin uh, with the first of our... Hmm? Thanks. Just a little distraction. Um, uh, Lara uh, Panak, I hope I pronounced your name correctly. Good. Uh, beautiful work, uh, very interesting narrative. Um, I don't know a lot of the backstory to it, and I don't think I need to set it up very much because it's pretty self-evident. It's very strong. Um, it's a young boy um, in various settings. I, I will leave it right there. Laura, please tell us about your work, and let's have a look at it. Hi, sorry. Uh, thank you so much. And thank you, everyone, for all your hard work and for having me as well. It's a, it's a real pleasure. Um, I'm just going to share my presentation with you. So um, personally for me, um, I just uh, I thought it'd be good to kind of just show you a little bit about uh, the kind of work that I do and how I do it. My work is um, uh, lots of research and kind of, uh, I guess you could call it sort of social documentary. So I spend a lot of my time um, gathering kind of inspiration, gathering things that I'm interested in, want to read, want to look at, want to explore, and then um, tenaciously kind of planning out all these really long term projects um, that I find I immerse myself into. And uh, the the project in the Helsinki show is one of those. Um, so I'll just kind of skip forward through a little bit. So my work is kind of based on play. Um, and this project was very much about that as well. So I shoot on analog, all of my work, um, I hope kind of tries to or within my process, push the boundaries of my practice. Um, and just be a little like bit more playful with film, with the process that I'm using. Um, and for me, the interaction with the people that I'm working with is incredibly important. Um, so uh, the, the project actually emerged um, from a project that I've been doing for about seven or eight years now, which is within my community. Um, I live in uh, East London and I'm Jewish and I wanted to explore the Hasidic community. Um, so I've been working with a number of families in the UK and Israel and in America, um, and just spending time with the women. And I really wanted to get a sense of the tradition, the values, um, the home life and everything that encapsulates being a Jewish woman. So, um, this project obviously took me to Israel and took me to places like Meir Shurim, um, but for me, it was, uh, it was important. I actually worked with somebody um, very closely. I didn't just want to uh, kind of shoot on the outskirts. So an example of this is um, I've been working with one family in London now for eight years. And this is just one family that I've been documenting um, and spending time with and capturing their family. And Devorah now, the woman that I'm working with, I've now seen seven more children enter her family. Um, so 
as you can tell, I kind of, I really enjoy that process of just um, immersing myself in it. So for example, these two twin boys here on either side of the table are now these boys here. Um, so I wanted to take this approach with Baruch and um, this was the boy that I met. Um, he comes from a very Hasidic background, an Orthodox Jewish background. Um, and I met him when he was 17. Um, and he was basically living two lives. We met um, in, in Jerusalem, we'd arranged a meeting. I explained I wanted to do a project about people that live dual lives. Um, and uh, he really fitted that narrative in the sense that he really is proud to be Jewish. But at the same time, um, you know, he, he wants to explore life outside of his traditional upbringing. So we began to explore that and kind of spending time together, doing things for the first time. So kind of going to cafes and uh, watching TV and playing computer games. Um, and it was a real pleasure for us to kind of go on that journey together. Um, so I spent like a year um, just kind of going back and forth from Israel. And then we built this narrative and it, it was a very playful way of working. And we wanted to really work on the symbolism of his journey, of his identity. Um, and really use the space within Israel to become part of that journey and that narrative, not just historically um, and not just in a cultural and religious sense, but also in a personal sense in places that, you know, he's dreamed of or in places that are important to him. And really use um, the symbolism of, um, you know, um, things that we were referencing in paintings, in music, in poetry, in prayer, um, and uh, and I worked heavily with um, 1854 Media, who actually commissioned the project. Um, I worked particularly with uh, Pax Oega and Bryony Fraser, who were incredible at soundboarding ideas with me, um, and just not just documenting um, a simple journey. This was about someone who inspires change. You know, Baruch chose to change his life and take a path that was completely different without abandoning his true identity, which was his pride in being Jewish. Um, he just wanted to explore in a curious way and did so in a very brave way. Um, so yeah, the project um, probably consists of about 15 final images. And then there is this short film, which is five minutes as well. Um, and it's uh, it's just been such a beautiful journey. And I'm very grateful to everyone that that helped me produce the work. Um, that gave me their time um, and trust and um, and allowed me to kind of explore a different way of working as well. So that's my presentation. Thank you all for having me. Um, and I'm looking forward to watching everybody else as well. I'm really appreciating being part of this wonderful festival. So thank you. Well, Laura, thank you very much. I mean, the work is... Uh, very strong. It's very impressive. And uh, I was very uh, curious of what your relationship was and how you, you know, worked on that series. Uh, it's a very, uh, clearly a lot of the pictures are, are well, the words often used is constructed. I mean, they're, you're, not, you're not working as a photojournalist. There's a narrative that you have with your subject. Um, and it, the, the result is very, very powerful. Um, yeah, I think the process is kind of building trust, then right. kind of uh, coming up with ideas and doing research and being inspired, then collaborating on ideas together and then executing it. Um, for me, I didn't just want to kind of run in there and document something. I wanted to create something with Baruch to tell his story. Well, I mean, it, and it, what I'm curious is, I mean, the, the shots are you know so elegant, elegantly composed and I say the picture of him in the water where he's just his face is just above it. I mean, it's you know, it's it's beautiful. Uh, it's you know, almost iconographic. You know, and, and you know, uh, Ophelia. You know, uh, is the ultimate image of that. Um, how how cooperative? I mean, what was the dialogue in, in that process? I mean, well, it's you're funny. It to a very fine point is what I'm. I guess I'm trying to ask you about. Yeah, I mean, like uh, when I first met Baruch, he didn't even speak English. So um, it was over the course of the year that he was learning English and we were just communicating and collaborating with other people that I met out there, just with hand gestures and, and it gradually kind of, and now, you know, we have very fluid conversations. 
So I took my ideas to him and I said, look, I have this idea in the Dead Sea. I think it's important. And then we'd spent the day at the Dead Sea. We spent two days at the Dead Sea. And then whilst we were there, we were just exploring the ideas together. And there was this one moment where his reflection was staring back at him. And, you know, we'd waited for that light. And I was like, yeah, that's pretty much summarizes your journey right now of you being these two identities and you're having to confront yourself um, in a very, you know, anonymous kind of peaceful setting. It felt quite meditative. Um, and it just, yeah, it, it was, it was less constructed in the sense that it organically came about as a moment. Well, I mean, I guess that's part of it, probably what gives it so much, so much of its freshness about it. It doesn't seem, uh, manhandled, manipulated. It, it does seem rather natural, effortless, the way you set them up. But, yeah, and I think that's down to Baruch as well in the way that he was just very open. You know, when we first met, the, the moment that we first met in, in the Shuk in, in Jerusalem in this busy market, within five minutes of us talking, of him dressed in full Hasidic gear and me in shorts and a T-shirt, we had a crowd around us, you know. <laughs> so, people like taking pictures on their iPhones and I was like, where's Beyonce? Um, and uh, yeah, and like, and he was just unfazed. And for somebody who's only, you know, he'd never spoken to a woman outside of his community before he spoke to me. He'd never yeah. watched TV, he'd never listened to a podcast, he'd never done anything. So for him to be brave enough to trust me and just kind of, you know, listen to what I had to say and and go with it was just such a blessing for me. I was very lucky. Oh yeah, no, I, I can imagine that would draw a crowd, uh, particularly in Israel. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it was funny. Um, but I mean, tell me, I I, I want to just uh, sort of deviate slightly from this. I mean, you talk very much about your Jewish heritage and about being a woman. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I, you know, I'm from New York City, so I, I mean, I, you know, I'm, most of my Jewish friends call me an honorary Jew. Um, just because you know, I sit shiver with them and things like that. But I've always found it, I've tried to have this conversation and often it erupts into an argument with being a feminist and being Orthodox or being you know, uh, conservative Jewish. Uh, I, to me, that seems like a contradiction. Can you, can you talk to a little bit about that? I think that we we all have the tendency, especially with kind of any side of extreme religion or culture that we don't understand, to pigeonhole a stereotype and, a, and adopt a kind of, I guess, a, a blanket kind of um, set of rules and regulations. And I think for me, I really wanted to unravel that. And I went in to this project uh, that I've been working on for years now, wanting to learn more about my Jewish culture, but also wanting to challenge my own perceptions of Jewish women or Jewish people or Orthodox people. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, when you said your friends describe you as kind of, um, what, how did you say, kind of- a, Honorary. Oh, the honorary yeah. Jew. I, my I Catholic friends say the same thing. It's just yeah. my inherent- I think uh, somebody said the other guilt. day, um, that's often called Jewish. You're kind of like a bit of a Jew. And, um, <laughs> and I, think, I think that's like quite, I think that's quite interesting that we have like so many different like levels of being one culture or one religion. Mm. Um, and that's what I wanted to explore. So this wasn't actually just about one boy leaving the community, or this wasn't about one Jewish woman having 14 or 15 children. This is actually about humanity and about bonding with people and, and, and going into somebody else's life who is so different from mine and us, you know, fusing together and learning from each other and spending time together. And I think because we have such opposite lives, it attracts both of us. So we're both curious about each other. And I think uh, that mutual respect and that mutual curiosity um, causes a lot of enjoyment, but also means that you really need to trust each other um, and, and, and just be generous you know, with your time, which is a lot to ask, basically. I would think it would take a lot of time to find that trust, to build it. Yeah, yeah, it really does. I mean, my, when I met Baruch, I'd been commissioned to do that project and my budget only allowed for two trips to Israel. And it was on the third trip that I met him, let alone wow. start shooting the project. So it was really, you know, me going out there and just spending time in all these places, meeting all these people, uh, speaking to so many people, getting all these tip-offs. Um, we being ushered on to the next person. I feel like uh, time is of the essence. Um, well, we are just about out of time, but thank you so much. It's really, I, I thought it was an outstanding, um, 
body of work and you know your story about it is, is equally as interesting. Um, well, and it, I and I've seen that you know the work here and it, it we, we um, was well, a it's a really good program. I mean, all, all the photographers here, in some ways they overlap and and um, we'll we'll get back to you later, Laura. But thank you very much. No, I look forward to listening to the rest. Thanks for having me. Yeah, feel free to join in. Okay. Ask questions, please. I yeah. will do. <laughs> thank you. Uh, Okay, we're back. Uh, I was reminded that I, I didn't bother to introduce myself. My name is Kurt, Kurt Richter. Uh, I'm from New York, but I've been uh, living in Helsinki now for just about 20 years, a little over. Uh, and uh, Raphael invited me to participate in the festival, I guess, about three years ago. Uh, Tom, good to see you. Hi. Welcome. Thanks. Thanks for having me. Very nice camera setup you have there. I'm impressed. I've got a very messy background, so it just helps to blur it out. Know. It's, 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 you know, circles of confusion. It's all out of focus. <laughs> yeah. um, well, I, again, I don't want to set up too much, but it's, again, this is a very um, thoughtful series, and it's, it's not uh, wanted, going out wanting with your camera. Clearly, you've gone out with a preconceived idea and uh, done a very powerful series of photographs. So without anything more than that as a setup, Tom, please go ahead and, and show us your work and tell us how you did it. Cool. Uh, great. Let me share this with you. Uh, brilliant. Can you all see that? Fab. So uh, first of all, I just want to thank you so much for having me here today. Um, it's uh, yeah, total privilege and, and, and pleasure. Um, uh, to do something like this it's kind of my first time at a photo festival and um very excited a little bit nervous uh it's kind of amazing to be talking alongside um just uh, an amazing set of photographers and um, people i've looked up to uh for years um laura's project was amazing um so yeah thanks for having me um cool so today i'm going to talk to you about uh my collaborative project uh, with featherwax studios called porter uh, which is a series of images uh, originally shot in India uh, and then relocated to a vast a series of, sort of surreal landscapes. Um, so a bit about me to begin with. Uh, for the last 10 years or so, I've been working um, in and out of full-time freelance photography roles and comms roles in international um, development charities. Um, and I've got a background in sort of languages and anthropology. Um, so my photography has mainly been social documentary type work and portraiture uh, for NGOs uh, in international relief and development um, with a bit of commercial work too. Um, so the origins of this project go back to 2015 when my wife, Sarah, who was a GP trainee at the time, was given a training opportunity uh, in Calcutta. Um, so I quit my full-time comms job uh, at an NGO in London and we moved to India for a year. Uh, so I've traveled a bit, but I've never been to India before. Um, and we didn't really know anyone, um, and I didn't really have much of a plan. Um, many of you will know this, that Calcutta has this sort of powerful set of uh, associations and stereotypes, um, like dramatically crumbling colonial architecture, scenes of extreme poverty, um, Mother Teresa, things like that. And these are often reinforced by Western gays and photographers. So I was kind of mindful about reproducing um, things like that and decided to kind of create a bit of a daily ritual of walking around different parts of the city uh, with my camera. Um, the intention being to kind of get to know the city a little bit. Um, and as any photographer knows, having a camera is just a great excuse to talk to people. So I've not got the skills of a street photographer at all. Um, I'm certainly not fast or bold enough, uh, but I used the camera as a way of making visual notes um, and it helped to slow down like the frantic pace of everything and, and certainly calm me down a little bit. Um, yeah, Calcutta is an iconic city, it's full of history and a, and a real strong sense of its own identity. Um, but I really wanted to focus in on something specific and concrete um, my time there. And um, I've always been drawn to markets and food culture 
I think it's an extraordinary gateway to what culture loves and what it holds dear. Um, and, and work has always been a subject of interest for me. Um, and I think the subject is interesting for Calcutta too. It's got this great reputation for education, but for people who kind of go through that system, many then often end up leaving the country or going to the kind of big uh, cities like Delhi and Bangalore and Mumbai, Hyderabad. And um, I think some of that is changing now. Uh, but my first project um, in the city was a portrait series focusing on market sellers in Newmarket. Uh, so Newmarket is probably the most famous covered market in Calcutta. Um, it has around 4,000 stalls and dates back to the late 19th century. It's nearly 150 years old. Um, and it's just this huge building um, with a kind of decaying Victorian railway station kind of vibe to it. Um, but I wanted to show the pride and, and the vibrancy that the place held. Uh, you know, the market sellers were really proud to be there um, and they took great care over their stalls and displays. Um, we just sort of beautiful um, patterns of the fruit and veg and the various things they, they sold. And it, they were kind of enthroned by these scenes. Um, and because of the, the nature of the building itself, like the lighting was quite uh, interesting. It's, it's got a vast sort of roof space above it, which is very dark. Um, and then quite harsh, bright, bare light bulbs lighting um, the product. So it kind of creates these intimate little vignettes around each stall. And I just wanted to capture um, something of, of that kind of intimacy. Uh, death and dilapidation obviously is a feature in this work too. It's kind of hard to ignore in a space like this. Um, but there's also a sort of sense of the theatrical there too, um, where the crumbling nature of the infrastructure creates this sort of canvas for life to happen in a very free and dynamic kind of way. And, and obviously when resources are limited, people are uh, often very innovative and creative. Um, and there's a sort of aesthetic quality to that I wanted to capture. Um, so I followed this trail through to Bara Bazaar, which is the largest or one of the largest wholesale markets in Asia. Um, it's a, a bustling port-like environment where kind of vast quantities of goods come up the Hooghly River or, or by lorries, and then they were uh, distributed into the city or West Bengal uh, or beyond. Um, and it's just an amazing place. It's you know, such a thoroughfare of goods and people, and it's you know almost always bustling in some shape or form night and day and um i was exploring it one day and kind of shouldering my way through the crowds and i looked up and just saw this kind of towering set of uh you know crates kind of almost like floating above the heads of the crowd and i was just gobsmacked by this sight and um and behind that there was another sort of set of kind of towering objects and this was how I first encountered the porters. It, it wasn't through their, you know, their bodies. It was through their, the kind of the towering items of things that they carried, carried sort of precariously on their heads. Um, and I was struck by the visual heroics of this work, um, but they were lost in the crowd most of the time. And I wanted to find a way to sort of celebrate them. Um, so I found a place in the market that was reasonably quiet. And over the course of a couple of weeks, Photograph the porters against a, a background that kind of changed with every uh, sitting, really, because um, you know the landscape was changing. Port, you know, porters would come in with sort of vast uh, pallets of plywood, and there would be barrels of wood. So we kind of had to maneuver our sort of scene around a little bit. And uh, but, but we shot a series, and, and, and you know, given the general busyness of the environment, I was sort of pleased to have got this far really with the project. Uh, but it hadn't quite achieved, I suppose, the visual message that I was I was going for. So the project then lay dormant until the end of 2020, uh, when I collaborated with a retoucher called Featherwax Studios um, to have another go at this series. Um, the porters were cut out of the scenes by Featherwax and then sort of relocated to uh, various landscapes. And I think as a result, the stories and the images become much more storied than before. Um, the extra space around each porter sort of not only helps to draw closer attention to each person and their load, but it also invites the viewer to imagine who they are and, uh, and what they might be doing there. Um, I didn't have much time to speak to each porter as they passed. They were very busy uh, and the items they carried were very heavy. 
Um, I didn't want to cause too much disruption to their work. Um, ordinarily, when working with subjects, I spend a lot more time talking to people and hearing their stories. Um, but in this case, it just wasn't uh, it's, it's practical to do so. But it was really important to me that each person was happy to be photographed um, and, and some did stay a while to chat. Uh, and in the course of these discussions, I sort of found out that many were internal migrant laborers, um, often traveling from um, some of the poorest surrounding states, uh, such as Bihar, to, to find work in Kolkata. So the kind of visual relocation of the porters to these new environments so sort of hopefully then makes a bit more sense of that journey and, and makes the travel sort of uh, of their story much more explicit. Um, and, and while the scenes are now kind of partly a work of fiction, they add a layer of detail and are able to reveal the kernel of truth that sort of the more straightforward documentary images I don't think were quite able to achieve. Um, and then the cargo that each port carries above their heads also sort of transforms in meaning too. Uh, no longer sort of representing just the literal items that each port is carrying. The cargo becomes something more like a backpack um, or might represent something like the weight or burdens they have to bear uh, as migrant workers. Um, yeah, so the, the life of a migrant worker is often full of challenges, uh, leaving your home for long stretches of time, traveling to new places, encountering different languages and cultures, these things are often really positively associated for the privileged, but can place those without those safeguards into a much more precarious situation. Um, so while I wanted uh, these images to communicate something heroic about the jobs they were doing, I also wanted there to be a layer that communicates mm, that sort of sense of precarity and dislocation. And in the midst of that, the bravery and courage that it takes to set out away from home, leaving loved ones behind, um, and finding a way to support themselves and their families. Uh, so I think there's something also at the heart of this idea that we can all relate to, that sense of carrying burdens in life, whether they're external or internal to our own psychology and the pressures we put on ourselves. Great, yeah, so that's the project. Um, it's evolved in unexpected ways. Uh, I didn't set out to work in a collaborative way, but there's something really interesting about letting other people tease out layers of meaning in a project. Um, and I'm hugely indebted to the skills and vision of fellow Act Studios in crystallizing that meaning and bringing it to life in this project. Cool, thanks. Uh, well, thank you very much, Tom. That was a, a wonderful presentation. It's, it's not often that people uh, set it up with, you know, the how you came to this point of doing that project, which is often, I think, uh, you know, of interest particularly to other photographers. Um, I, I try when I, if you're having a kind of discussion like this, it's open um, to not get too technical, but it is a photo festival. So I, 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 I can't help myself. Um, <laughs> the lighting in that is rather, uh, it's very elegant, but I also know that you have to use a very broad light source outdoors. Uh, that's not easy uh, lighting that you did. Uh, just to point it out, I mean, you may have noticed uh, that the the light uh, was different than the light in the background, and often it was a little bit brighter than the background light. I'm just speaking to generally to the audience now, uh, if they were looking at the pictures that it does give it a somewhat surreal quality because um, that you, you won't find that light in nature. Um, but it, I, you said you didn't spend a lot of time with them. I, I can't imagine it didn't require a certain amount of time to have them get them in position and, and uh, clearly had a dialogue with them. I mean, they didn't just you yeah. know stop for a second. I mean, it's unfortunate you can't see the pictures larger because you, you obviously engage them. It's a serious portrait. Mm. You know, what mm. was that process for you to get them into that position and, and then sort of get them to disengage the camera and the whole process and, and address you? Because that's what happened. Yeah. I, and I suppose when I say sort of short period of time, these, these concepts are all relative, aren't they? I think ordinarily, you know, it, it takes me at least an hour to photograph someone. I'm kind of slow in the way I work. So, uh, you know, we, we were probably spending somewhere around the region of sort of 10 or 15 minutes um, with each person. 
or, or, or you know, if people really needed to go, then, then five minutes. And, and often it would be a matter of like, um, you know, saying hello to people as they walk past and then maybe, you know, they'd put their items down and we'd help them and we'd kind of just <coughs> time explaining ourselves. I wasn't there alone. I had um, my friend Sujat Ragosh, who's uh, a brilliant photographer and activist in his own right. And, and we were kind of uh, muddling through together. Um, but yeah, you know, it's a bit of back and forth. You, you, you set up for the ideal circumstances, don't you? When you're kind of lighting someone in the, uh, external environment and then you just need to kind of um, move things around a little bit and uh, for each person and so we would we would show people the, the pictures and then they would kind of get the idea and then you know we would take a few and we'd stop and we kind of go through them together and, and just sort of you know people that way slowly got the idea of what we were up to because it's weird like it's not an environment where you're you know you're seeing a lot of people taking photographs it's you know Calcutta is a really photograph city um and you do see a lot of photographers around but you know down this tiny little alleyway alleyway which was a thoroughfare for you know these goods basically being taken off the river and then and then into the rest of the city I was there with a really old light with a cable trailing across the ground and you know someone holding on to this this modifier so it doesn't blow over so we were kind of you know we were a weird spectacle in our own right and I suppose like, you know, like Laura mentioned previously, it's just fun to have an opportunity to play with people and engage. And like the photographic process for me is one where like that's that's where the magic happens to me. I think that, you know, I, I do like photography, but it's really the, the process is, is where I find the you know, things get interesting and you just get to kind of, yeah, have fun uh, with it. So, um, it, it, it wasn't as quick as I maybe made out, but you know, uh, it's okay. as, I think we're all right now. As things go, is everything right? Yeah, forgive me. I I uh, I, I have a, uh, kicked my foot at the wrong moment, at the wrong direction. I mean, I I didn't mean to interrupt you. Sorry. Don't worry, you're good. Yeah, it's good. Yeah. Well, I mean, it it it's rather striking. I mean, it it, it I guess. It, 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 you, you're setting yourself up to make it, you're very ambitious in what your image that you're trying to get. You're sort of working against a natural flow, I guess it would be my comment, uh, to a, a absolutely stunning result. But I'm curious, I mean, you say it's around Calcutta, there's no evidence of any urban setting in, in any of the pictures that I recall. Yeah, so so that that is the work. That is the work and the genius of the retoucher. So the the landscapes are not they they weren't there in the moment. So those are the, uh, the those are different landscapes from different places that have been kind of okay. Uh, yeah, yeah. I, I was suspicious. <laughs> yeah, was yeah, yeah, where, yeah. I, and, It and looked I, like okay. Yeah. And, right. and I tried to be transparent about that because you know I think especially oh. within in in the world of sort of photojournalism and documentary photography, you know that there is uh, quite right you know um anxiety around uh you know doctoring images and and, and sort of so you know so-called changing the truth but um th this project had no such pretensions of being kind of you know realism in in that sense um or, or certainly as the project evolved it kind of happily <laughs> cut ties with reality um but you know i think that's that sort of interplay of like you know the, the kind of the fictional environment with with the the porters who were shot in that environment um is sort of where it became you know alive for me and, and, and certainly began to be much more suffused with meaning um than, than the original set of images were um you know various people will interpret that in different ways and that's sort of, you know that's part of the interest i guess well i mean it's an interesting topic it, 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 you don't hear it very often anymore but you know people would really say you know does the camera lie yeah um as if it had the capacity to have that kind of consciousness if it's you know um, yeah it, it, to me that's just a, a laughable question i mean it's uh you know you might as well talk about you know you know um, a, a sinister spoon you know i mean it's an inanimate object you know yeah. what you as a photographer brings to it but i think part of that is that they see a photograph as a dna molecule with reality and it isn't really um, no, no it, it doesn't, yeah yeah, no, yeah, go ahead. I, 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 I'm trying to lead you in to, to give yeah. me, to your well, thoughts on it, because that, that is it. You will get called on that, obviously. 
Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, I understand I understand that, you know, truth is precious, but also truth is, is complex, isn't it? And I, and I think, you know, as a photographer, I think we almost need to be just really much more honest about all of the decisions that we make, you know, whether it's lens, because the lens is changing the perspective with you, which you can see things and what fits in a frame and, and your decisions about, you know, when you take the picture and how you frame it and uh, and then sort of how, how it's processed and, and then how it's captioned and, and how it's placed afterwards. There are, there are so many decisions that kind of are encountered along the photographic process that are, you know, decisions which influence what and how is is transplanted to the viewer. And I think, you know, I, I, I suppose that we are getting much more, our visual literacy is growing as we see more pictures. And I think, you know, in, in times of uh, artificial intelligence and, um, you know, the growing sort of CCTV presence and, and the way that images are, uh, you know, manipulated. Now, I think we are all going to need to sort of really step up our visual literacy about sort of calling out stuff that isn't real but then also being okay with you know making making up things that sort of serve a different kind of truth or tell a different kind of story and i think you know as long as people aren't wedded to this idea that photography is you know the truth as it happened i mean it's like a fraction of a second isn't it you know life doesn't work that way that we can pull a, a different face uh you know in 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 such a short space of time and I think you know I think that the conversation around what is photographic truth and our visual literacy is is evolving and I, you know um I am nervous about putting myself in the firing line for kind of uh, well, uh, you put yourself right in the crosshairs <laughs> yeah but I, I suppose that I feel like being transparent about the process is like part part of oh I I, I think it's a very interesting question and it it, it will go only get more complicated as time goes on yeah Tom, thank you very much. Uh, and again, uh, I wish we had more time, but um, certainly a, a you know, really wonderful series and uh, really interesting to hear your thoughts on it and uh, the backstory of it. Thanks so, so much for having me. Oh, great to have you. Thanks again. Cool. Um, I think we uh, have a, a little pause between our next guest or not. Is that right? Hi, we're back, uh, Charlotte. Uh, uh, forgive me, uh, Nano. Is that all right? My, I'll leave it at that. Um, welcome to the program. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me. So, uh, again, yeah, go ahead, please. Yeah, first the ball's in your say, court. I want to tell you sorry for my bad English. I will try my best to be understood. I will speak slowly, and if you don't understand something, please feel free to ask. I'm sorry, what did you say? <laughs> no. Go ahead, go ahead. Okay. Yeah. I was fine, you're perfect. Your English is perfect. I try to share my screen. Uh -huh. Can you see my screen? No, not. Not yet. Not yet. Okay, thank you. Okay. Well, let's just talk a little bit about the work while you uh, um, sort out the uh, uh, which button to push. Um, the uh, okay, there we go. Yeah, it's okay now. Yes, we're there. We're okay. on. Okay, your pictures are up. <laughs> so I'm going to present you the series. Thank you, ma'am. Started in 2017. Uh, it's a photographic series between my mother and I. Uh, it was a way to face the news about my mother's incurable illness. Um, the doctors were very pessimistic uh, and told us there, um, there was not much time left. So it was very difficult to, to deal with the idea of losing my mother. Um, I think it's not something we can imagine and realize before it happens. So I decided to leave Paris and to go back to my mother home and to spend time with her. So I really wanted to stay with her, to reconnect with our environment, to with uh, our memories, to capture everything about her. 
I was comp completely petrified with the idea of uh, a countdown. Um, so I went back to her and I remember all the nights where I simply told her, Mum, we are going to make images of that. And that was the beginning of the story. We really knew about the, the urgency and the importance of sharing this experience together. Uh, so like two days after, um, I, I begin to take photographs. Uh, I begin with one, I don't know where is she? Uh, this, I, my first photograph was, uh, is this, this picture. Uh, it's my mother laying down on a white bed, kind of white bed uh, in the wood covered by mushrooms and uh, flowers. It's, it's for me a striking photography uh, because it's the first of the series, but it's also representing the allegory of, of death. Um, so at this point with this first photograph, I really felt the way I will construct all my images, always on stage with a, a dark and a poetic atmosphere. Uh, so in the images, you, you can see animals, you can see flower, you can see wood, you can see... Um... Okay, I try to... Animals. You can see... Um... Uh, it, it's an atmosphere, uh, something, it's a, something really organic, really me nearly mythologic. Um, Okay, so most of the photographs were taken in the French countryside and my mother and me often appear naked, nude, really at ease with nature. For me, it was very important to be naked with uh, my mom um, because uh, for me, it's, it's kind of truth. It's kind of uh, um, a skin to skin like in the in in childhood or in motherhood so it was very very wrestling to 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 have to have skin to skin with my mother mm. so with this series with the uh, thank you mom i really trust in power of images in the power of images um when i'm i was taking picture i felt stronger i felt braver more and more close to my mom, like fearless, like the, the theme of the Helsinki Photo Festival. Uh, in, in each photography, I literally ask for a miracle. Uh, <coughs> and all the photographic put together are like a prey for a miracle to save my mom. I didn't want to build something sad or something too dark. Um, I didn't want the viewer to see anything about any disease or something, but rather a strong love and a strong connection between the mother and the daughter, like a, a nod to my mother. We are like two, um, two heroines, two, two fantasy characters in, way, in, in the wood together. But more than images for me, um, it was a time to to meet my mother, not like a, not, not like a mom anymore, but like a friend, like a girl, like a, like a child. And it was time for me to to become also a woman. And uh, I think you, we can feel the transformation in the story of me beginning becoming sorry for of me becoming a, a woman and not a girl not the girl of my mom anymore so uh, every time spent together was a movement of freedom and and an act of resistance um sorry it's a little it's a little bit hard for me to to talk about this project but i try my, my best so to finish i i just wanted to see that um that the, the theme fearless of the of the photo, of Helsinki photography festival uh match 
quite very good with uh, the, the series because uh, not with us without fear, but with a will to to de to live and deceive destiny, whatever the co the cost. We were facing death, and uh, Charlotte, I think, let me. I'm sorry to interrupt for a second, but the yeah. pictures are very beautiful. I was want to ask you if you could go through them a little more slowly so that we can we can take in the you know the images. Yeah, we, yeah. that's a fact. <laughs> Just take your time showing us the pictures. They're very right. strong, and you know it takes it takes a moment to to absorb an image. So um, give yourself five seconds at least per picture, um, because it, I, I I I feel like I've I've only gotten glimpses of the work. Okay. Sorry to interrupt you. Go go ahead again. Okay, uh, I don't know where uh, what, what I was saying, but just to to understand the the series it's to resume it's like it's um it's it's a meeting with a woman with my mother but it's a meeting uh, with two women in a way and and fearless also because we we are facing death and we we manage to transcend all the hard times in something, I think, I hope, something poetic and something strong and and real. Voilà. And to finish, I can show you the current exhibition in Arles, in Les Rencontres d'Arles Festival. Uh, up. Mm -hmm. There is no, there is no narrative because we can put the image, the images in other. In, a, in, a, in other order, um, it doesn't care. I don't because it's it's uh, all about emotions to put all these little images together. So it's not it, there is no narrative or no. I I I felt free with colors with black and white using side different sides. And there is also a book um, because the series uh, won the HSBC prize for photography. It's a French prize, um, a good French prize. So, so now there is a book. Okay. Yeah. That's um, it's a very moving uh, series. Uh, I, I obviously talking about the passing of your mother is it's a sensitive topic to do in such a public format. Um, but that that was very brave of both of you to go through that process. Can you tell me more about what it was like you know, doing that with your mother? I, is your mother still with us, or is she has she passed away? She passed away in like uh, eight months. Well, I'm sorry for the loss. Yes. Yeah, but it was um, it was a chance to do that with her to to meet to meet her in other ways that that than my mom only my mom and to stay with her. Uh, during a lot of months and and working with her uh, like three nearly three years oh. to construct our, our intimacy intimacy our, our relation it was not really easy but we we had a lot of fun in fact 
Um, it, it does, I wouldn't use the word fun, but it does look like it was fulfilling for both of you. I mean, what, what kind of dialogue did you have in the process of making the pictures? Oh, it was, it was very, uh, each picture is, is taken re really quick because it's, uh, really? it's, it's often in winter and uh, <laughs> well that would explain why you did it quickly. and naked so it's cold you know and uh, and with uh, our content you can go out uh, and uh, you can you can't be you can't have a um, cold uh, cold uh, right. so i have to to put my camera and uh, and to say okay mom you are going to lay down uh, on the bed and she's like Oh no, Charlotte! It's cold. Hurry up! So, hurry up! So it was very, it was funny. You know, it it was the the series is not sad. She's nostalgic, maybe. No. But it's talk about it. it it's talking about about uh, being alive. It's not talking about no. death, really. So we were talking, and and she was she was very demanding. Uh, Oh, and tomorrow, what we will taking, uh, what we will do. So no, that's... It, it was very instinctive. I, 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 I had no time. Um, I didn't know how time the doctor said, said to us, like, uh, you have, okay, 10 months. And uh, I was like, uh, 10 months, 10 months to do what? 10 months for what? I was completely petrified. Mm. But in reality, we had three years, so we were lucky in a way. Right. I, I mean, it, it, that's one of the things that's difficult for any human being is we obviously we understand that death is inevitable, but um, it's still an abstraction. Um, I think it's remarkable what you did um, you know, with your mother. You're facing it together. Um, it's uh, it, it, it's and congratulations on the book and the exhibition. I'm curious, what what have people said to you when they've seen the show? I mean, you know, we um, at a I certain point we all lose our parents, and um, yeah, I was yeah. wondering what what uh, you know did anybody speak to you about that after losing you know a mother or father? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, yeah, I didn't expect it that the series uh, could uh, have, could speak to a lot of people. Uh, I didn't think about that uh, at all. So um, I saw some people crying a lot, crying yeah. and, and don't talk to me because because <laughs> it's, it's it's difficult. It's um, it's hard time for for them too. So. So a lot of cry, but a lot, of, um, lot of, of thank you. They say to me, thank you. And, and uh, they say, I think the better compliment wa wa was, um, uh, I'm, I'm glad you did that because I, I couldn't do that with my mom. Uh, so you did that for me, so thank you. So for me, it was the best compliment. I can I can't imagine anything sweeter. Yeah. Um, well, thank you so much uh, for sharing your work and telling us about it. Um, it's a beautiful series, and um, uh, I, you know, one of the things that a photograph can do is it it can preserve a moment, you know, yeah. as a memory. Um, and that, what a beautiful way to create a memorial with your mother for your mother. It's yeah. very moving. Uh, you brought me close to tears. Um, no. But it's, yeah. No, I, I mean, you know, it, 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 it's very powerful. Thank you very much. Thank you, Carol. Uh, oh, of course. Uh, let me, well, uh, we have one more guest to go, and then I'd like to have an opportunity for maybe to get everybody together, if we can um, share some of our ideas. There are certainly threads that go through all four of your work. Uh, so uh, our next guest is uh, Lisa uh, 
Sorry, forgive me. Lisa Prom and I. Hi, Lisa. How are you? Hey there. How are you? I'm fine, thank you. Welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me. Oh, it's our it's our pleasure. Um, again, I mean, there is a common thread, and it was at the the four of the photographers tonight. Yeah, um, amazing work, isn't it? Um, yeah, beautiful. Well, good. I mean, I hope we can get all together and have a little conversation if we have time at the end. I won't. I, I probably had said too much. You shouldn't, you know, tell the plot, you know, uh, of a play before the curtain goes up. Uh, but again, uh, the four of you do. You're obviously working on narratives that you must have, in some way, you know, had a pretty good idea of um, before you began the project. And I won't say anything more than that. Uh, Lisa, please go ahead and show us your work. Okay, I'm going to share my screen. Hold on. Uh, okay, so uh, thank you for having me today. It's it's an honor to be here. Uh, I'm I'm Danis born and current currently working and based in Barcelona. And I work with photography. Oh, hold on, just hold on. Sorry, I'm in again. So I'm Danis born, but I'm currently uh, living in Barcelona and I work with literature, film and photography. Uh, I'm presenting my project, which is called Uncertainty and Possibility. It's an ongoing project that started with the birth of my firstborn daughter. Our eldest daughter, Andrea, is challenged by a rare syndrome. It's called 5P minus. It's a chromosomal condition caused by a missing piece of information. It's something called, uh, doctors call it a deletion. And in her case, it's a, a missing part of the arm of chromosome number five. This disorder is characterized by intellectual disability and delayed development. She may give the impression of being vulnerable but she really is magic, strength, balance, connection, empathy, and sensitivity. We watch her empower each day, become who she is in her essence. Some days are crazy wild, some days softer. And meanwhile, we, her family, strive to create an open space where she can be herself. These intimate photography sessions are a family collaboration. She offers me an alternative viewpoint and a sense of ease and peace. It's kind of like she lost a piece of her chromosome five and I found a, another way of seeing. On bad days when doubting my parenting skills or fearing there is too little space for her in society with its high speed and other current more urgent and critical situations to solve like the one we're living in. I try to turn her to her gaze, uh, drawn in symbols and light. And then I realize there is more to diversity, uncertainty and acceptance. We figured out there is actually hope So we embrace poetic and a mix of documentary and stage photography. We speak skin and poetry. There's also storm and beauty. And this is so in order not to get lost in reality and infinite sadness. That's why I draw myself to poetry and skin. Our story is full of subtle doubt, introspection, and sometimes also discomfort, but also strength, symbology, 
and life. This is Andrea and her grandmother, my mother. This is it. I'm off camera. Oh, thanks. Sorry, Lisa. I was, I, I, we had a problem getting me back on online there for a moment. Well, that's uh, I, wow. Following that last sequence of uh, uh, Charlotte's of her mother, and then your um, your your dressing. I would guess is the word to use it. Uh, you know, limitation of your child. Um, they're both very moving and, and um, you know, it's a sensitive topic to talk about. Um, it's very courageous of you to have done, done that work. Um, uh, it's very different. I have to say the, the, the work that I see, the way it was presented, there was only, I think, one or two of the constructions that you had. Um, mm -hmm. yes. And so it, I, I, didn't, I didn't quite understand them. Now right. it makes it, more sense. It's a, it's a very long series. It's about 58 uh, photos. Mm -hmm. And the ones exhibited in Helsinki are 10. And they're, very, they're, they're the initial photos that I, that I shot. It's an ongoing series, um, but it's the first time I'm showing them publicly. Um, I have done other work uh, with Andrea and with my family. Like we shot a documentary film uh, that was launched in 2013 um, in, in movies and, and the Spanish broadcast TV. Um, but this is, a, this is a collaboration with them. So it's, uh, it's, sometime, uh, it's sometimes uh, more playful. Um, and it's important to me to draw them in because now the girls are uh, older. Uh, Andrea yes. is 16 and Billy is uh, 13. So it was very important for me to start the series. I had the series in mind, of course, but it was very important for me that they are aware of what we're doing and, and that they're part of the creation. Yeah, I, was, I would like to hear, can you tell us more about that process? Um, it's Because uh, it, it, it does look like they, they were, you know, uh, Time was taken in setting up those pictures. There must have been a dialogue. You know, can you tell us more about that? Um, it's a, no, it's pretty fast actually. It's a, it's more or less intuitive. Um, um, and the ideas, uh, for example, the titles are very, very important for me because sometimes the photo is not as explicit or obvious as it could be. But with the title, it gives you another run. Like, for instance, uh, I've ended up working with a lot with tools and uh, mm -hmm. to draw ourselves into the idea of the building of a family, like how to build a family. What do we need? Uh, and then mm -hmm. with these tools, we create the scenery. And sometimes it's big scenarios. Sometimes we're it's my my partner loaded with things uh, because of the heavy weight of parenting and sometimes it's it's very uh, subtle and it's um, the oxygen mask for andrea when she's in, in struggling with her oxygen wow. um yeah so kind of, it's it's, uh, it's uh, i'm interested in in the construction of the the, the building of uh, becoming a family and what our experience is and documenting this. Well, it, you know, I, I, anybody who has, you know, who's had children as a parent, it, you know, it, 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 it is work. Um, uh, I, you know, as a parent of two, I mean, it's probably the richest thing I've ever done, um, but it's also one of the most demanding. Um, in your case, it's there's a an extra 
layer to that um, responsibility. It is. it is super demanding and it's hard and it's tough and it's storm and it's uh, anger and it's uh, pain, but it's also so much more. Um, yeah. Because at the end, like, um, one becomes a parent and one doesn't really, well, I, I, at least I didn't think of the consequences like uh, directly. It's more intuitive, right? You, you just become a parent, but then uh, things start to happen and you start uh, making decisions and you start becoming uh, another person because you, yeah. you start exploring, okay, how strong am I? Can I, can I, can I do this? You know, you start questioning yourself, but at one point, um, you just let go and, and go with, you know, ride on it and go with the flow. And, and somehow we're realizing this thing with the, the hope. You no, know? I, I think Andrea is teaching us that there is hope. And this is very, very important to us at least. I would think that, that the one element we, that, that is necessary for any human to survive is having hope. Um, yeah. We're almost out of time. I, I don't know if we can squeeze it in, but I would like to see if we can get everybody together. Is that possible? There we go. Welcome back, everyone. Nice to see you again. Um, I thought maybe if we just, you know, let's do a little round table. Um, and, um, Laura, you were the one to begin. So, I mean, let's, let's see if you have any thoughts in passing about the work and um, the presentation tonight. Any comments that you'd like to make? Not to put you on the spot or anything. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's so interesting to, um, to see such diverse ways of working and working methods. And I think the one thing that really unites all the work is the intimacy and the way in which um, I think we all have kind of a process of intimacy whether that be you know with our mothers with our children with the people that we're working with um and it's so interesting how that presents itself in such different ways um and i just feel really privileged to be like genuinely you no know, not in a shitty cheesy way <laughs> like i feel genuinely really privileged to be um to be showing work with you guys like i i really love the the, the different visuals the different approaches the different subject matters um and i think also you know all of our work touches on something universal um the universal themes of kind of love of connection mm -hmm. you know, of interaction of, of of culture of all these different things um so i i think that's a wonderful fusion and um isn't it great that such different work can all sit in the same space um, yes so yeah that's my, <laughs> yeah. my very tired kind yeah. of no, no, well, well said, well said. Enjoying. So, um, yeah. No, oh, thank you, Laura. Tom, anything to say in, briefly in conclusion? Yeah, I mean, I echo what Laura said. It's just, it's completely amazing to see all of your work. Um, I think in some ways the, one of the differences between like my work and all of your work is that I have really like shied away from you know, the personal, I suppose, in my work. And I find that uh, really inspiring to see it in, in all of your, your work and your processes. And I, I think it's incredibly brave and courageous to, to turn the camera back on yourself in some way, even if that's sort of... Yeah. Um, Good point. Um, you, you know, and I don't know if I'm allowed to ask a question, but, you know, all of your projects evolved over time. You know, they're not, they're not kind of turn up and shoot and then, and then walk away. They're the involved conversations that take place over months, you know, and years and, and you know, the, the, the dialogue and discourse with your subjects must be really interesting over the course of a, and the life of the project. You know, do, do you find that this, the subjects ever sort of change their feelings or their mind about participation? You know, do you, do you sort of, how do you feel about that evolving relationship over time? Sorry, Tom, who was that your question directed to? Kind of, I mean, you're, you're all doing these kinds of projects, these kind of long-term projects with, with sort of, you know, with subjects that, um, you know, you're, you have a personal connection to, right? you know, you have to live with that, don't you? It's not something that you Yeah, I think for me personally, like the people that I'm working with are always strangers. 
they're mm. people that I've met and I've had to gain that trust. And just because you gain that trust to begin with does not mean that that is consistent. Mm. I'm shouldn't be taken for granted. And I definitely have people not, I wouldn't say revoke access, but definitely change their perception, change their mm. mind. Um, and also people change when their work is showcased. You know, when I create projects, I never have the intention of showing work. Mm. I just have the intention of being present and being there and creating. So when your work is in, you know, one of my projects, uh, one of the women's daughters was, was shown in the National Portrait Gallery. And when you're from a community where you don't have the internet and you don't, you know, uh, operate in the same space as, as other people, um, that can be quite challenging. Mm -hmm. And it's just about really checking in. You know, I've been working with her eight years, but last month we sat down and wrote another contract together and mm -hmm. just kind of talked about where the work would go, which images she liked, which ones she didn't. We talked about she didn't want the work to just be about her family and i was like that's cool you know it's not it's about women so mm. and mm. i think i work with adolescents and young people a lot and that's particularly tricky because it involves parental consent guardian consent also young people are uh, i've had young people you know display vulnerable behavior and i've had to make a decision to kind of be like okay or well, i need to stop showing those images or i need to reach out to them and have a conversation but it's hard because once you've created an image, you let go of that control and you can't control the internet. You can't control the distribution of your imagery and you can't control how it's going to be interpreted. Mm -hmm. But what you can do is control your intentions and how much you follow up and check in with people. Um, and I think as long as your intentions are, are good and mm -hmm. you don't want to hurt anyone, then. And I never pretend to be part of a community, although I would dress respectfully mm -hmm. or make myself vulnerable. I would never pretend to be something I'm not giving access. Mm -hmm. But what about you? I guess Lisa and Charlotte, you work with people very close to you. You know, you work with people that are that you love more than anything. How does it change your relationship with them? Charlotte, do you want to go? Sorry. Sorry, I didn't know. Well, the question, I, I, the question was, what, what, what Laura was pointing out was that uh, one of the distinctions between uh, Lisa and, and, your, and your work, Charlotte, is that, that it's intimate family on uh, both Tom and, and uh, uh, Laura's work. They're, they're, they're going beyond their, their personal life, reaching out to something, you know, separate, you know, into society uh, in a broader way. Um, and Laura was just asking about, you know, your feeling about that, you know, being so introspective. Um, I probably didn't phrase that very well. My apologies. It, it, in, in, in my case, um, the, going back to Tom's uh, question about uh, if the relationship changes or, or it, uh, yeah, it does really a lot because uh, my girls are grown old and uh, like they're teenagers now. Uh, and sometimes they don't want to get involved and that's fine. Then I work, I do constructions with my partner, <laughs> you know, or myself or, um, but it's really nice when they enter and they, they want to be part of it. And it was very important, as I told Kurt before, that for me, uh, that they were aware of what we're doing. Uh, I couldn't do this, have done this when they were babies because, uh, you know, I wouldn't have had a dialogue. It would have been me staging everything. And now it's it's just it's getting funnier and funnier. But I'm I, they're hard negotiators, so I you know they're negotiating everything. Uh, for example, now I have this uh, this idea of um, one of uh, Andrea is a really good painter. She she, she does these amazing drawings, and I would like to uh, pull up a, a drawing by made by her by her and make a sculpture of it like with all the colors but with um with wood what with wood and and make like a big really huge structure uh so that uh, we can see her painting uh in in 3d mm -hmm. and, and and i think we're going to have fun with that but of course <laughs> I, I need to kind of um go with the time and see where where, where this project takes us because uh, it can go everywhere. Yeah. Well, that's the nature of life. I'm afraid we are yeah. way uh, over time, uh, but I want to thank you all uh, for joining in the conversation tonight uh, and giving us your 
uh, presentations of your work and give us a context to it. Uh, I do want to thank uh, uh, my producer, Laura McCrone, and um, and Wonderwall, Evelyn uh, Wonder Wonder. Forgive me. Well, I'll just leave it at Wonderwall. Um, but uh, again, thanks for both all of you for uh, sharing your work and your our, our thoughts on it. And uh, with that, I'll say good night. Thank you thank again. You for us. Good thank night, you, everybody. Thank you for having thanks us. Bye. 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 Uh, well